Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, where they're, I was told that their views are converging towards the end of their lives, as opposed to the standard yeah. treatment that says, you know, mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther King was for love and peace, and Malcolm X was for by any means necessary. But, um, but you know, Martin Luther King said that when he was talking about the Vietnam War that he had fought segregation so long that he couldn't segregate his conscience. And I think uh, the end of Spike Lee's uh, Spike Lee film, he shows both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King together mm -hmm. because of their views. I mean, do you have, what do you think about the relationship between these two men? I think they would have come much, much closer together. But we have to first see the beginnings of both. I mean, Martin Luther King came from a middle class background and his field was in religious field. And so of course he would be, you know, against violence. Uh, Malcolm came from the ghettos and, uh, and would never forget things like when his father was killed by Ku Klux Klan and his body found on the railroad tracks and stuff like that. And because he came from the ghettos and because back then there weren't many jobs for blacks, even though the 60s isn't that long ago, but things were very tough then. So it's, it's not unusual that he would be going very much against his country and of course while he was in prison seven years, he did a lot of reading. And so by the time he came out of prison, well, Malcolm was already becoming a different person. And here, he be both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X loved their people. They were leaders of their kind of community. Martin Luther King, was a much more of a mass leader of blacks because it's much easier to follow someone like Martin Luther King who believed in nonviolence and integration and they would get support from Americans and the governor and media. Whereas Malcolm X was for separating and becoming totally independent and to do it by any means necessary, if it means to go to war. And so, I mean, it was, they were on opposite ends, even though they both wanted to help their people, they were quite far apart then. But I think both of them, as they heard of the work, uh, I think Malcolm, when he saw the huge following that Martin Luther King had, he, I think, respected Martin Luther King that he must be a good organizer to bring that many people into the movement. And I think Martin Luther King, after hearing some of Malcolm's speeches that were very radical, felt that, wait, maybe Malcolm is right, that there's no nice way to change America who has done such violent things to people of color. And and then to there came a time when Martin Luther King realized what the United States was doing to Vietnam. And actually Martin Luther King was I think the last black leader to go against the Vietnam War. All the other black leaders, whether they were uh, Stokely Mark, uh, Carmichael, who became Kwame Ture, or Rap Brown, who became Jamila al or James Foreman, or all of them were against the war, except Martin Luther King. And I think it's because Bayard Rustin, who was also a nonviolent uh, leader, kept telling Martin Luther King, don't get mixed up in that, you'll be in trouble. But I think Martin Luther King finally realized that Malcolm was right. What's happening in Vietnam is wrong. And so he gave that famous speech at Riverside Church, which astounded the whites because 
Martin Luther King finally said, America has no business going into a peasant country like Vietnam and keeping them from choosing their own kind of government. And then, you know, shortly after that, Martin Luther King was executed. Of course, by then, the Mar uh, Malcolm was dead three years. He died in 65, and King died in 68. Uh, you know, Malcolm X, uh, you, uh, you know, in, in the film, I think recent, in the Ali film, it shows a Japanese-American woman standing outside the doorway of the Audubon ballroom. Um, uh, when he's about to deliver his speech, or I think um, just before he was yeah. going to speak, yeah, right, and, uh, and he was killed, right. right, and and you, you know, were one of the first to um, to come to his the comfort, you know, at that period of time. So the um, famous Picture in Life magazine, you announcing Malcolm X assassination. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like? Oh, yeah. Well, it, well, it was. Um, February 21st of 1965, and there was a lot of rumors that people thought Malcolm was going to be killed. Yeah. No one knew who, whether it would be NOI, Human Rights Group, or it would be the FBI or CIA or government or what. Yeah. So that day was Sunday, I think, in, I don't know, this Everybody got to the Audubon Hall mm -hmm. around 2.30 or so. And what seemed strange to everyone was that all the people who were invited to speak that day, none of them showed up. Mm -hmm. I think because they were afraid something was going to happen that day. And so the only one who spoke was one of Malcolm's lieutenants, Brother Benjamin. But Everybody, I think, that went to the Audubon that day had a, some Very kind funny. of a funny feeling yeah. that something's going to happen today. Mm -hmm. My kids loved Malcolm. Mm -hmm. I took my oldest son, who was 16 maybe then, mm -hmm. you know, and we were sitting there when Malcolm was going to speak, and all of a sudden, almost right across from us two black guys jumped up and one yelled out get your hands out of my pocket and so everybody in the auditorium turned to look at these two guys who were fighting and then while we're all looking at them i don't know about three other black guys who were sitting up front right up to the front and malcolm who was just about to speak he came from behind the, what do you call, podium. Uh -huh. So he was a, a great target, you know. He could, and here these three guys started shooting. And by the time it was, we all looked back to the shooting, we didn't expect anything like that. Well, Malcolm was already shot many times, and he just fell backwards. And the whole place was a pandemonium. People were yelling and screaming and chasing the guys who did it mm -hmm. and they were i mean somebody maybe the guys who, who who did it had smoke bombs and and all the chairs came crashing down it was just utterly what do you call it pandemonium mm -hmm. but some young brother ran past me and I thought he seemed to know what he was doing, so I just followed him mm -hmm. up to the stage and, mm -hmm. and I just put Malcolm's head on my lap. I don't know if he was dead or alive, he never said anything. Mm -hmm. And then the police came and mm -hmm. took him across the street to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But it was the saddest day for Harlem. Nobody could believe that it could happen. But then everybody was saying that they knew that the U.S. government did not, not just did not like him, they felt threatened by Malcolm's leadership. And the media 
had been demonizing Malcolm for months so that people, some people didn't like him. I mean, he could be set up to be killed. And so it wasn't, I guess, that much of a shock. But I think after Malcolm died, instead of scaring the black movement, the black movement was more intent and also saw what this American government could do. And so the black movement became very, very strong. It's like thousands of little Malcolms, you know, came up on, you know, after his death. And it was just, just a, an experience that I don't think any of us would forget. Now young people want to be around you and to learn from you. And if one of my my students in particular want to know how they can organize and how they can uh, be more active because it's a different generation now than you know, they grew up in the 60s. You know, uh, do you have advice for young people these days? Well, I think one thing is because they're students, huh. number one, they must read as much as they can and especially about injustices all over the world, and especially in this country. Injustices, whether it's through racism, or classism, or inequality, or what. I mean, they must know the negative side of society, so then you would have an idea, what do you want to change in society? And I think it's good to know the history of this country, how little by little it's changed. So I still consider America one of the worst countries in the world because of its power and money, and, uh, its military, mm -hmm. that U.S. is one of the, well, is the number one imperialist country, and Japan is not different from U.S. It's also an imperialist country that did so much damage to Asia. But right now, America is all over the world. You know, they have troops already fighting in Colombia. They sent a couple more thousand soldiers to the Philippines. They're thinking of bombing Iraq, besides all the damage they did to Afghanistan. So I hope Asian American students realize what's happening in this world right now and start to join the larger uh, um, movement that's all over the country already against the war. And I hope maybe in your school, Stony Brook, that the Asian Americans, well, I'm sure other students, students must already be organizing against the war because even High school students in this area are organized and they're in marches and all. And I think that's one thing that Asian Americans should do. Another thing is that Asian Americans have not been that active in supporting political prisoners. And one of the key issues in this country would be political prisoners because political prisoners were community activists who belonged to a political group and did maybe some political acts. A lot of them were even in shootouts with the police. But these political activists raised social and political awareness of their peers in their community. But because they were such leaders, they are all of them that are in the jail, especially blacks, but Latinos, American Indians, very few Asians, but also uh, white anti-imperialists. And the biggest name, of course, and he's world-renowned, is Mumia Abu Jamal, yes. you know, those pictures there. Yes. And uh, there's so many others, Leonard Caltier from the Indian group, mm -hmm. uh, so many Puerto Ricans still in prison, although Levin got out under Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the white anti-imperialists are large in number. 
there's two Asians that we consider political prisoners. One is Yu Kikumura, and the other is Tomo. See my memory. How could I? It's Tomo. I hope it comes back to me mm -hmm. from Japan. Mm -hmm. We consider them. Well, we. I don't know if we should even say that word because today, with all this talk about terrorism, mm -hmm. the U.S. government hears something and they'll take mm -hmm. it wrong. Mm -hmm. But these two are, I consider, not just radical activists who, be, who were captured, but they were revolutionaries. Mm -hmm.